Try to be as fully aware of your body sitting right here as you can, how it feels in all the different parts. The ideal awareness of the breath is one spot as its main center, but its range should go all the way down to the body, all the way down the arms to the tips of the fingers, all the way down to the torso, the legs to the tips of the toes. This is your space. And you don't want to leave it. The more fully you can inhabit it, the less likely you are to go anywhere. And the body can settle down and have a sense of being secure. The mind can settle down and have a sense of being secure right here. Because there are so many insecurities in the world out there. Of course, the body itself is not all that secure. One of our chants reminds us that we're subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death. But for the time being, this is your home base. And home base here has some potentials. The texts that talk about different elements in the body. And they're not talking about the chemical elements, they're talking about the elementary feelings by which you know you've got a body sitting here. The breath is the primary one you want to focus on because it's the most responsive to what you want to do. All you have to do is think longer breathing, and it'll breathe a little bit longer. Shorter breathing will be a little bit shorter, deeper, more shallow, heavier, lighter. You can take advantage of that, try to get a sense of what the body needs right now in terms of its energy. and adjust the breath accordingly. When you find something that feels good, stick with it as long as it feels good. And if it starts feeling not so good, well, you can change again. Try to keep on top of things. As you get more sensitive to the breath, you get sensitive to the other elements as well. There's a sense of heaviness, that's earth. Warmth is fire. Coolness is water. On a cool night like this, you might want to think of a little bit more warmth inside. It's like playing with the knobs on your stereo. Once you get a sense that you can think about these different elements, and you can focus on where in the body that particular sensation is strongest. With warmth, you might find something warm down inside the stomach or around the heart. Coolness might be closer to the skin. For heaviness, you can think about where your bones are. And then ask yourself what's lacking there. The breath and the heaviness, i.e. wind and earth in the old terms, balance each other out. And then water and fire balance each other out. So try to get a sense of what's just right. After you fiddle with the knobs on your stereo, you decide exactly how much bass, how much treble, how much volume you want. And then you can enjoy. Learning how to create a sense of well-being inside like here is a gift you can give to yourself, and it's one of the potentials that we've got with these elements. puts the mind in a better mood, it's healthier for the body. When the mind is in a better mood, it's a lot more likely to be willing to do what has to be done. We many times know what we should be doing, but we don't want to do it because we don't feel like it. Or when we know what we shouldn't be doing, but we'll do it because we want it. It's because we have a certain hunger for these things. Now, if you can satisfy your hunger for pleasure by Breathing well. One, it's cheap. You don't have to pay anybody for the breath, at least not yet. Who knows what they're going to try to figure out and privatize in the future. But right now, we've still got our breaths. You feed on that. Because you're good, but you're in a good mood, you're much more likely to do the right thing because that hunger for pleasure is being fed. The 
this is why it's good to be able to learn how to take this skill as you go through the day. Because otherwise you're going to be hungry for other people's words, signs to make you happy from them. You're going to be needing other people all the time for your sense of well-being. That's where you look for food because you're not providing food for yourself. And when you're feeding on other people like that, often it can get unhealthy. So learn how to feed yourself well inside. You become more and more self-sufficient. And when things outside turn bad, you've still got all you need here inside. Because that's especially when you're going to need this. It's very tempting to, when things get difficult, to say, well, the rules don't apply anymore. When things start breaking down in society, people start behaving toward one another in ways that really are not human. They get to be more animal-like. You don't want to take them as your guide. You want to take the sense that you know what's right and you can stick with it regardless. Now, to make that regardless, you have to learn how to have your own inner sense of strength. The sense of well-being that comes from conservating the mind and the breath like this is an important strength. It's really food for the mind. The Buddha lists other strengths as well. There's conviction, belief in the Buddha's awakening that it really is possible through human effort to find true happiness. And that our quest for happiness is not a very short thing. It's something that's been going on for a long, long time. And so when you make any decisions, you want to keep not only your immediate interests in, in sight, but also your long-term interests. You combine the conviction with discernment, which you realize there are short-term kinds of happiness and there are long-term kinds of happiness. And the beginning of discernment sees that you want to be able to abandon the short-term ones, if necessary, to gain the long-term ones. It's a trade. And there's effort. You realize there are certain things you've got to do. You've got to put in effort, like we chanted just now, giving rise to the desire to abandon unskillful things that have arisen or to prevent them from arising to begin with. The effort to give rise to skillful things that aren't there yet, and once they're there, you want to maintain them. This involves your motivation in addition to your ability to put in the energy. Again, the concentration is really good here. It helps give you the strength you need to stick with this. And then there's mindfulness. Sometimes we hear mindfulness defined as just open awareness or open acceptance, or bare awareness, purely a receptive state of mind. That's not mindfulness, that's equanimity. Mindfulness is keeping things in mind, particularly what's skillful and what's not skillful. And you learn this either from listening to others or reading books or from your own experience. And you want to have that at your fingertips. So that when something comes up in the mind, greed, aversion, delusion, or something good comes up, rapture may come up. How do you handle that? If you had experience in the past, then you're going to apply it. The basic principle there is that whatever comes up, you want to stay with the breath. Don't go jumping off into any rapturous feelings that come up. The breath is the cause, and your ability to stay with the breath will allow this sense of rapture to bathe over the body, and once it's done its work, to fall away. So you stay with the cause, and the results will take care of themselves. You want to be able to remember that. Sometimes visions come up in the meditation. You want to remember how to deal with them. 
One, if you don't like them, just breathe deep down into your heart three times and they'll go away. In other words, you reestablish your awareness, reestablish your frame of reference. If the vision seems to have some information for you, or if it's, sometimes it's not a vision, sometimes words come into your head. You have to remember you can't believe everything that comes in the mind when you're meditating. But if it sounds reasonable, you can put it to the test. See, well, this might be right. And see what kind of results you get. In other words, the, vision the visions themselves are not the measure of whether they're true or not. The measure of truth and things like that is what happens when you put it into practice. This is a principle that goes all the way through the teachings. So these are some of the things you want to remember. This gives strength to your practice. You realize you've got some tools to deal with whatever comes up. You're not left defenseless. So when the mind is strong inside like this, you know, the sense of well-being, a sense of solidity inside, feeling less and less threatened by things outside or some of the things that may come up inside. You're a lot more act likely to act in ways that are for your interest and for the interest of others. Notice that your interests and the interests of others are not a zero-sum game. In other words, it's not always the case that you gain or other people lose. I mean, there are some things which that does apply to. Material wealth, status, those things. There's only so much to go around. But with the goodness that comes from the meditation, the goodness that comes of generosity, the goodness that comes of virtue, that kind of goodness spreads around. And because your gain in these things doesn't mean that anybody else has to lose, these are the kinds of goodness that create a good society, where people can live together, not be constantly putting up boundaries and trying to amass as much as they can in their own little boundary. It's a goodness that overflows boundaries, erases boundaries. So it's good all around. It strengthens you and it strengthens your relationships with other people. And as John Munn once said, the goodness that doesn't have any drawbacks. That's genuine goodness. So the meditation is one of those forms of goodness. The more you do it, the better. And this way the goodness spreads into you and spreads out into the world. <laughs>